All right, so it's uh, 1550. Um, I'm going to kick this off. So my name is Bill Roberts. I'm going to talk about um, System D, its integration with uh, TPM 2.0, and uh, some of the fallacies and pitfalls that kind of uh, pop up when you're doing that type of integration work. Um, and uh, so we'll get going. So with this crowd, probably a lot of people here have some background. Like I noticed a lot of the discussion or the presentations mentioned TPM somehow, but I'll just do a really brief intro to it. So if I say TPM, I mean TPM 2.0. There is an older 1.x device that kind of started the whole TPM thing. It's kind of really old. It's deprecated. I haven't seen one in a while. They're still out there, but yeah, we're talking about TPM 2.0. And so it's a, the TPM is this thing called a trusted platform module, and it's a standard by the trusted uh, computing group. And at a high level, it provides storage. So you can say, hey, TPM, you know, create me a key and store it um, through some protection mechanism. It does measurements. So we've seen a lot of talks talk about those PCRs. That's that measurement state that the TPM can provide. Reporting, there's a whole attestation protocol around the TPM. So it's, it happens to do with like, you know, signing the PCR measurements, how do you get them to a remote server and perform the attestation protocol. And then cryptography. So not only can it create keys, it can also use the keys to do things like, you know, asymmetric and symmetric cryptography, um, you know, like RSA, HMAX, et cetera. AES, but not all TPMs support AES. Um, this talk is mostly going to be around storage, the protection of those uh, storage keys, and specifically the disk encryption key. So if anybody's like familiar with Windows BitLocker or something like that, it uses the TPM to store the disk encryption key and protect it. And then that disk encryption key is eventually released later. And then so what is systemd? Um, so this is the init process, replaced the init system. It bootstraps most Linux distros, at least the ones I use. Um, it provides a lot of stuff. It's not just an init system. It's an ecosystem of things. And one of the things that it has is native Lux disk mounting and um, TPM2 disk enrollment. So it has sets of utilities and, and things that are integrated into systemd that lets you say, hey, I want to take this hard disk and I want to enroll it with a TPM key um, for protection. So this is not a talk on systemd versus init. And this is not a talk to be critical of systemd. Um, I know Leonard very well. Um, and other projects have made the same mistake you're going to see along here, like uh, you know, Parsec. Um, there's a couple others. So I want to talk about like what these problems are and what we can do. And again, this talk is specifically, as far as systemd, is going to talk about that Lux disk enrollment. So what is the problem? So there is a potential attack vector with TPM 2.0. So by default, whenever you send a command to the TPM and you get a response back, that is all over plain text. And right, so there's a certain TPMs are going to be discrete, i.e. it's like its own little chip hanging out somewhere, or it's going to be you know, built into the CPU firmware. And uh, so the typical attack vector is like the bus. If you have a discrete TPM, you could hook up some wires on the bus and you could sniff all the traffic going to and from the TPM. But it could be other potential parts of the system. And I think a lot of the other talks about this in this conference have brought up like different execution levels or different execution environments and usages of TPMs, whether virtual TPMs. However, you're getting those bytes to and from a TPM whether it's virtual or physical, and those bytes cross your trust boundary, you probably want to protect them. So this is a known attack, and the TPM 2.0 architectural docs actually describe this in detail. And then if you're actually looking for like a real world instrumentation of how you could perform these types of attacks, if you just Google TPM Genie, there's a great GitHub page. It's got source code. It tells you how to do it. It walks you through it. Um, it's actually kind of fun to do. 
So while this is a known problem, that architectural documentation also describes how to circumvent it or to prevent it, mitigations. So there's these things called sessions. Unfortunately, to get the sessions, you have to opt into them. There's a lot of different sessions. If you look at the TPM documentation, which um, is very terse at times, uh, the sessions you care about are these things called HMAC sessions. And you go, oh, well, HMAC's great, but yeah, it's like integrity, right? Well, there's, there's other bits you can set when you create the session. There's, um, there's bits for encrypting the data to the TPM and then bits for telling the TPM to encrypt the response data. So you want to enable those types of bits. And um, you can think of this conceptually the same as TLS. And you want to do the th same things that you would do in like a TLS session. Um, again, the attack vector is typically the bus, but again, like a point that I really want to drive home is anytime your bytes of communication leave the trust boundary, think about it. A lot of people just go, oh, I'm using the TPM, it's good. Well, maybe not, depending on the scenario. Um, and another nice thing is when you enable sessions, whatever client application your software is that's communicating with the TPM, it's endpoint to endpoint, right? So no matter where that application moves, like if it gets moved, you know, ported to a different system, it still should work. So this attack has gotten a lot more press than I think it actually deserves because it was known. Um, here's just one, but if you, if you Google the attack, you'll see like all sorts of documentation, or not documentation, but news articles, bit lockers broken, um, you know, pick, pick a vendor that's making a TPM chip, oh, their security doesn't work, typically happens to be around the firmware-based TPMs that are built into manufacturers' processors. Um, so, again, this could be thwarted with that encryption. Um, and the problem that I'm going to show you is that people were even using sessions and thinking that they were getting these protections, but they were just saying, hey, TPM, create me a key pair. Now encrypt that communication channel with the key pair you just created. Uh, that kind of, you know, in a TLS session, you're going to walk that certificate back from the public key to actually make sure it's signed by some CA that you trust. You don't ask the server to say, hey, server, create me a, a key pair, and send me the public key, and I'll trust it. And that's kind of another problem that was around here. Um, so the system D support. So they added this support in. So system D actually added that support for like a bit locker type thing. And they added support for encrypting and decrypting uh, um, hard drive contents. Uh, the way that it works in the TPM is that when you want to create one of these disk encryption keys for your hard drive is you generate the disk encryption key, not the TPM. So there's two types, essentially two types of like keys in the TPM. One where you say, hey, TPM, create me the key. And one where you say, hey, TPM, here's the key. Disk encryption keys are, hey, TPM, here's the key. I'm going to give it to you. And you might ask, like, why? Why not just let the TPM handle all of this? TPM is slow. TPM is not good for bulk encryption. In fact, most TPMs do not support, um, like, AES or something like that. You actually want to get that key back in raw bytes because... Uh, you can hand it off to certain types of hardware disk controllers where you can actually, they'll perform the, the encryption and decryption so it's not even done in software. So if you want like that hardware acceleration stuff, they kind of need the key to do the work. So um, because this key is essentially going to and from the TPM, uh, and the TPM is really just kind of providing data at rest protection for the key, the uh, that man in the middle attack is kind of useful because you can get that disk encryption key. So um, here's the timeline of changes. So um, these are system D version numbers on the left. 
um, version 248s where they had that initial TPM 2.0 support with no attempts to do any type of encryption. Then they enabled session support. Um, and then that's kind of when I went to go look at their implementation and noticed there was a problem. And then I kind of worked on mitigation steps after that through version 252 through version 254. I forget what version they're on now, but it's like two upper 250s, might even be 260s by now. I don't know. He, they do move pretty quick, but most of the recent distributions, like I'm on Fedora 39, it's, it's new enough where um, you're fine. So visually, this is what I've been explaining. Um, if you're just in a plain text scenario, you have the key. It's coming from the TPM. An attacker on the bus or on whatever communication channel it is gets the key. They have your disk encryption key. They can use that in an offline attack. Yeah, not particularly interesting, unless you're the attacker. Uh, version 251. So this is where System D actually was like, hey, let's fix this and actually solve this problem. So they um, you know, enabled the session protections. Again, it's just like TLS. Uh, but they, the weakness here is that they failed to verify the public key. And this is like the, the second time in a public repository I've seen this happen, and I'm sure it's elsewhere, I just don't know about it. I've seen it in a lot of proprietary software. So when you're using the TPM, verify your public keys if you're using them for some, you know, you should both well, verify your public keys. That's a good idea. Um, so this would be akin to like trusting the root C, any root CA for TLS or accepting any key pair over SSH. Like you're just like, oh sure, that's a fine key. Just it's good enough. Um, and so how would the attacker though actually do this, right? Oh, actually let me show you. So this is their vulnerable code snippet. This is generally the code flows I see in other people's software is they'll be like, they'll call make primary. They'll get a key pair from the TPM and then they'll do something like, all right, I'm gonna start up that encrypted session. So if you're auditing code bases or you're working around the TPM stuff, keep an eye out for stuff like this and then make sure that, you know, like something like make primary or make encryption session is actually verifying the public key and one thing to note here is uh, the way that the TPM works internally is the keys are in a hierarchy. Uh, the primary key will be the root key within the uh, key hierarchy. And then um, you can make child keys under it. So, the, so that's what that means. Like if you see primary key, it just means it's like the root parent key for a key hierarchy. Okay, so this is where they added the, the session encryption. So how would an attacker actually take advantage of this? So an attacker would say, all right, you want a key pair for the session encryption? So like when they call make primary, as the attacker, I just give them a malicious primary key back where I control the private key. And then I just, as the attacker on the bus, I enable the I just perform what the TPM would do, which is session encryption. I do all that. If I need to forward commands to the actual TPM, I can. I'm in full control. I can decrypt the communication stream. I can send stuff. I can see all the data coming back. And they have no idea. They would never know. So in this case, when they, they send the key encryption key back, or the disk encryption key back, um, you just decrypt the communication stream, and you have the key. Then the uh, client application, in this case, system B would never know. So um, that's when I, I saw this and I was like, okay, so what can I do really, really quickly to make this a little bit harder to pull off while I figure out how to fix their code um, and also figure out if they want patches? <laughs> so the simplest step was to add something called a bind key. So in the TPM, when you set up a session to enable the encryption between the client and the TPM, there's essentially two ways you can set this up. One's called the TPM key, and one's called the bind key. In the TPM key, you use 
the asymmetric key pair to encrypt a salt with the public key. And then you send that when you start the, the encrypted session with the TPM. TPM has the private key. It can decrypt the salt. That salt is used to seed the, um, the session key. The bind key is suppose I make an object in the TPM and I put a password on it. That password is known by me on the client side because I created it and it's known by the TPM because the TPM has to, to actually perform checks against that password. And what it does is you can use the bind key to establish the session key because that's the shared secret between each side. So instead of actually having to encrypt something and send a salt over, you just use the the symmetric, you just use the password as, as a symmetric secret to, to enable everything. The uh, problem with this though, is that any recorded traffic can actually be decrypted offline. Um, so you could, you could you know, use a crack attack on a dictionary attack or something to, to derive the password and then decrypt the, tra the traffic. Um, so like weak pins, so like, if you've used this feature on system D, it's like put in a pin. Most people are gonna be like one, two, three, four. So it's not really useful. Um, I'm gonna skip the rest of that. So version 252, this has the bind key. So we set that up. The attacker in this case could still be sitting there and, and faking the encryption for the primary key but they couldn't do the other half with the, um, with the bind key. So they could get the traffic back and they would see the layer of encryption from the bind key, but they wouldn't actually be able to um, do anything useful. They'd have to take that information and then take it offline and try to crack it. So um, how can we make that better? So it was a quick stopgap because it was literally like a two line change. It took like two seconds. They accepted it immediately and put a release out. But again, the, the traffic can be brute forced. So how do we fix weak pins? We add entropy to weak pins using a PBKDF. Um, so we added, uh, we used HMAC SHA-256 because they already had HMAC and SHA-256 there in their crypto library. So I just had to put them together in a PBKDF. The other nice part about this is, um, so we have to store the salt that gets stored in the Lux metadata for, um, for the super block. But now like if you have your disk encryption key and it's protected by pin 1234, well, anybody could go offline around that, go straight to the TPM and be like, oh, give me the key. I know the password, it's 1234. Now you need to have the salt to do that. So that greatly also protects users like weak pins from uh, just having another backdoor into the TPM. And this really just leaves kind of like one more task left. And so here's, here's kind of like a visual of what I was just describing is um, it's the same thing as before, but they can't really take that offline now and, and mount that attack. It'd be much more difficult. Yeah, see, the attacker's sad. So the last thing, and this is like the thing that I really want people to be looking for if they're working on TPM, is like if you're gonna start an encrypted session with an asymmetric key pair, do this. So um, this, this is the TPM key parameter in TPM2 start off session if you're actually looking at the documentation. Um, I'm the maintainer of the TPM2 TSS project on GitHub. So we have something called an enhanced system API that makes this process easier. If you use the native ESIS TR types, which um, some people do not like, but the idea here was to bind the object's location in the TPM. So TPMs just have handles to objects with the name of the object, which is the cryptographically unforgeable actual objects. So like attackers, you need the name and the object location to guarantee that you're talking to the right thing in the TPM. So if you use ESIS TRs with the enhanced system API and you use that to start um, sessions, you're just fine. 
If you use the feature API, which is probably not going to be useful for most of this audience, it's definitely more of like a high level API. Like, but if you're in user space, systems level of programming up there, that'll be fine. And the feature API does this all under the hood for you. You just call functions like give me the key and you don't even have to worry about it. Um, the ESIS TR gets stored in the Lux metadata. So where we stored that salt in the super block, this just gets shoved in there as well. And the security model around this is first to set. So when you enroll the disk encryption key during that time, when you seal it to the TPM, that's when we actually record what the primary key should be for the encrypted session. So this is like SSH when you're like logging in and you accept the remote server's public key fingerprint. Um, so again, eSAPI will take care of everything. Um, and this prevents the attacker from supplying that public portion of the key. Because instead of getting it from the TPM, you're just getting it from the super block for the, for the disk. Um, and then all the unsealed traffic within system D is, is uh, protected by sessions now, even when no pin is present. So like the bind key approach only works if the user specifies a pin, but if they do a pinless setup, now they have those protections as well. And this allows um, different auth sessions, uh, different like models of protections for the keys. So like Leonard was just putting patches up to system D yesterday where you can do like PCR policies and other things. So, um, and have all those encryptions and protections in place. So uh, in this case, this is, this is just not even possible and uh, the attacker is sad. So if you're on version 254 or greater, everything should work and be secure. The other, there was kind of some miscellaneous issues that I fixed along the day, along the way. Um, System D was creating a primary key and every seal and unseal, which is really, really slow. Even though they were using ECC, which is way faster than RSA, um, you don't really need to do this. And there was actually no way to specify the owner hierarchy, the owner off for the hierarchy that the primary key was made in. So which means if you actually deployed a TPM with an, an owner password set, which is you should, it's recommended in the, the uh, provisioning guidance documentation, there was no way to actually make this work. So I don't really know how they were deploying this in practice. Um, so what we did is I changed the primary key to use what's called the storage root key. Um, this is part of that provisioning specification. Um, and it's, it's really just a known key at a very specific address in the TPM. And it avoids this owner auth requirement. So it's, it's kind of like a scratch space for everybody that wants to use the TPM without being the owner of the password, which is typically gonna be controlled by like an IT organization and not the end user. Uh, they have a spot where they can create keys for the TPM without needing like special passwords and stuff. So future work, it would be really nice to um, do the TPM to seal path. So right now the seals are going uh, unencrypted to the TPM. But at that time, we're assuming that the TPM is in a good state. That was that first to set model. So when you do the seal, that's the set. But it would be nice to be like, I want to do a seal. I want to use this key, this public key to protect it. If you're in a, if you're in a state where you know what you should be expecting in the TPM. With, so that way we don't have to blindly trust what's there. You know, you could, you could add an option to, you know, supply the name of the object or, or something like that. Um, and I guess we could drop the bind key argument now. There's, there's really no, no use for it. I just didn't do it. So if somebody just wants to write a one line patch to delete, that'd be great. And then um, I'll throw some thoughts here on SPDM. SPDM is pretty great because it's going to be a generic um, way to encrypt and decrypt traffic to peripherals. Um, TPM 2.0 devices are going to support it. I've seen some early hardware. I haven't seen anything in the market, but it's supposed to be coming. But you're going to need to have like add support for this and do stuff to get it to work. The TPM kind of already has it, and it, you won't need the newest hardware to do it. And as you port to different things that may or may not have it, you just know that if you port this design, 
it's going to work the same everywhere. So I'm a huge fan of adding session support to the TPM and not relying on SPDM until maybe it becomes more widespread. And then in summary, um, use the feature API if you can. You don't even have to worry about this. It just does it for you. If you're going to use the enhanced system API, do it correctly. Use, store, use the SRK. You don't need to be creating primary keys uh, unless you have a very specific use case. And uh, so that's my contact information. And uh, I'll open it up for Q&A. Oh, I thought I was going to get away with no questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you were saying that to verify the public key of the TPM, you basically just read it from disk, and that would probably be like totally unencrypted. So what's uh, stopping an attacker from just modifying the disk and saying, oh, the TPM's public key should be me? So in the, <laughs> in the attack, this is why the, the attack I kind of have questions on, is that somebody's on the bus between the TPM and the host CPU, right? Yeah. Well, they don't have access to the disk. <laughs> okay. They can only be there. They can't be on the disk. That's why I, I'm saying that's the attack. Now, in instances where um, maybe your bytes are going across an untrusted boundary, like maybe you're in like a T and the rich OS is moving those bytes to the TPM for you, if you set up that, that will prevent that rich operating system from being able to tamper with the communications. They could DOS you, but they couldn't do that. Yeah, if somebody actually has physical access to the machine and can get to your, to your physical TPM, I mean, they, they have physical access to the device, right? That, that's why this attack, I think, gets blown out of proportion. But the press is an amazing thing. Yeah, I guess, could you like somehow say, oh, here's the public key of all the TPM manufacturers and then verify it's an authentic TPM device? So there is a way to do that. So there's this thing called the endorsement hierarchy. And in there is you can create this thing called the endorsement key. And that endorsement key is going to map back to a manufacturer certificate, which um, so it gets really difficult to do that because there's a lot of different um, CAs that are used to sign these. And so like if you're in like really, really low level part of the stack and you're trying to walk a cert chain back and verify like I think our code base can do it, but I think it's but it's hard coded for like at least twelve root CAs right now. Now one thing you can do is some TPMs actually let you remanufacture them. So essentially you take over this endorsement hierarchy and you set the endorsement key. And by changing all that, you could then just issue your own certificates all tied to one root CA, and then you could just have one, one root CA to verify to. And, and that would be way more feasible for like firmware when you're trying to do this real down, like down low, it's really difficult to do. All right, thanks, good talk. Yep. So with V254, man in the middle attacks go away. Is that correct? In theory. In, oh, uh, okay. So um, with versions prior to 254, and, and I know you indicated that um, this was not intended to be a talk on uh, System D. But uh, do you know if there's uh, any way to uh, discover or, or detect uh, if System D has been compromised for the versions prior to 254? Does my question make sense? Yeah, it does. I never really thought about like trying to figure out if it's currently being compromised. Okay. It'd be you'd have to be looking at at the communication and then mm. understanding what key was being used, and then maybe verifying that that key isn't certifiable in the TPM to like maybe like the, the EK or something, like to a key you trust. So there's a way to ask the TPM, be like, hey, is this key actually in the TPM? 
and you certify that key to another key that you already know and trust. So most people will certify to the like the EK or something. Um, you can do it with any key as long as it meets the correct attributes. Um, that that could be a way. And then you could see, okay, this key isn't in the TPM, but it, it'd be tricky to do. Okay. Probably better just to upgrade your system D if that's a tack you're worried about. Upgrade my system to V254 and hope, in theory, uh, there I'll have no man in the middle. Concern. Yeah, it, it depends on like what your your attack model is here. So like the classic attack model is somebody on the discrete bus. But if somebody's on the discrete bus, they can probably get your discrete disk too. So, but I mean, there's all sorts of weird ways to use this session encryption. Like we have the ability where you can run your uh, TPM connections over an SSH connection. Mm -hmm. So. You know, when you're starting to cross potential trust boundaries there, properly setting up your encrypted session and not relying on SSH, which is only going to get you from machine to machine, mm -hmm. not inside the machine. Mm -hmm. So. Um, okay. Thank okay. you. Yep. You don't get to ask questions. <laughs> hey, Will. Uh, the latest version is 255, by the way. Uh, my question is, um, which PCRs does SystemD uses for sealing the password when, uh, when you're using this? Uh, oh, so, okay, at the time of this, PCR policies wasn't there. So it was just uh, pin-based or nothing. Um, during this time, Leonard was adding PCR stuff. I didn't look super closely to it. Yesterday, he just uploaded a bunch of stuff for being able to tie it into PCRs. There's currently three different ways to tie it into PCRs right now. Don't ask me what they are. I know the simplest one is just to say, here's a PCR policy, but that gets really brittle, right? Because as updates happen, then your PCR policy is out of date and you can't get to the key. And I'm not sure what he has for a fallback mechanism. Maybe you could unseal with just the user auth or something and grab it. I'm not sure what he did. The newest one is using a uh, is essentially using various policy signed type ideas, so you can actually have a mutable PCR policy. But I literally just looked at that stuff yesterday, so I'm not really the right person to ask. Gotcha. Just because from an attacker perspective, if I can swap out System D because it wasn't measured into some PCR, that seems to be a pretty clear uh, attack. That I just you know swap yeah. out System D to log whatever pin you, the user is entering. If well, I yeah, if you're, access, right? I mean, if you're swapping out things, yeah, right? And if it's not somehow reflected in a state that's going to get caught by some policy, exactly. then, yeah, exactly. you win. Cool. Thanks. Yep. All right. Looks like we're done.